Hello everyone and welcome. Um, I want to start just by saying thank you for this opportunity for me to be part of such a great parenting initiative. And we're all very grateful to the um, Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this a reality. Um, if you have any questions today, please um, post them either in the chat box or in the Q&A um, section. And then at the end of the session, I'll try and leave some time so that we can go through um, questions and I'll, I'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, I've also prepared a handout for you, um, which has lots of different parenting strategies on for you. So hopefully you'll find that helpful. So just to tell you who I am, my name's Tamsin Grimmer and I work as an early years lecturer at a university that trains teachers. So um, I'm also an author of several books aimed at educators and people who work with very young children. And during this session today, we're going to be thinking about positive parenting. Um, so I'm going to just share some slides with you now. So hopefully this will appear on your screen and you will be able to see what I'm referring to. So what we're going to cover during this session is dealing with um, sort of common challenges that you might have and trying to remain positive. So seeing behaviour very much as communication and also we'll, we'll think about teaching our children to be respectful, making friends, good choices, things like that. So um, that's, all, that's what we're hoping to cover today. Um, it's quite a lot to cover in quite a short time. So what I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, just to start off with, thinking about the importance of turning incidences and things into problems to solve. Um, what we're going to think about are how we respond to different words. Okay, so you will find a a chat box. I'm just going to um, open that myself as well, hopefully if I can. Um, if you would like to post into the chat, you are welcome to, or if you want to have paper and pen handy and you can just jot things down, then that's fine too. But what I want you to do is think about what comes into your head when you hear the word conflict. Okay, so just think what comes into your head when you hear the word conflict. Okay. Great, thank you. So some of you are just um, typing a few things in there. So we've got fight difficulties or struggles. So other people might be writing their ideas down at home. Usually when I ask this question, people say things like fight, even war perhaps. They might say disagreements, quarrels, clash or friction or disputes. All of these sorts of words come up. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you that to do the same thing now with the word power. So what comes into your head when you think of the word power? Power. Okay, so thank you. We've got an, another few ideas there. We've got strength, authority, and often I hear words like um, might or force even, control, perhaps leadership, things like that. Okay, now the last uh, word or phrase that I'm going to ask you to unpick now is problem solving. So what would come into your head if I say problem solving? Problem solving. Great, I think more people have found this one a bit easier. That's fabulous. Look, we've got alternatives, conflict resolution, uh, doing things perhaps, making things better, challenge, solution. 
So problem solving tends to be about resolution, solution, fixing things, a remedy, a way out, an answer, all of those things that you're saying there. So if we just take a second to think about those three words, when we were thinking about conflict, were the words we came up with, like fight, quarrel, disagree, all of those things that, that just came up, were those words positive or negative? So we had fight, we had difficulties, struggles, dispute, quarrel. Do we think those words are positive words or negative words? I'm looking quite superficially here. <laughs> Okay, so those words are pretty negative. All right, so thank you for that, joining in with that. What about our words we came up with for power? So we had a bit of a mixture. We had authority and strength, but we could have had things like force or control in there. What do we think about those words? Are they positive or negative or a mixture of the two? do we think about that so we've got mixture there oh yeah but what about position in terms of power absolutely and that could be positive or negative didn't couldn't it depending on how you look at it so um lastly then what about problem solving when i asked you to do that for problem solving were the words you came up with um positive or negative absolutely positive thank you so much so interestingly I've done this particular exercise again and again with with um, parents and carers with educators with teachers with all sorts of people and overwhelmingly the message is the same if we're thinking about issues with our children in terms of conflicts that makes it very negative before we've even started. If we see it as a bit of a power struggle, um, that can go either way. There's a real mix of positive thoughts and negative thoughts in there. But if we see it in terms of problem solving, that is 100% positive. I have yet to have somebody use a negative word when I ask them to um, give me synonyms or, or different phrases meaning problem solving. So um, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because as, as um, our colleague there has said, sorry, um, uh, Juby has said, diffuse the issues. Problem solving does that. It changes it from being a negative fight or a power struggle or something into something very positive. And this is what we need to do with our children. So just very quickly, I would like you to have a look around your room, wherever you are right now, okay? I want you to look for green and blue things, okay? So you're looking around your room for green and blue things and just make a note in your head. You don't have to write down anything now. Make a note in your head. Where are the green and blue things, okay? Now, what if I were to say, point to something red? Could you immediately point to something red? Or is your head now full of the green and blue things around you? Okay, so what's actually happened there, our focus was on the green and blue things and not on the red. Okay, so when we're focusing on the bad behaviour or the negative things, okay, we're not focusing on the good things. And it kind of taints our thinking a little bit and, um, you know, how we perceive our children. So what we're trying to do in this session is to try and think about this in a very positive way. So we're going to be looking at parenting and, and the difficulties that, and the challenges that we sometimes have as a parent. We're going to look at it as an opportunity to problem solve and an opportunity to support our children and to remain very positive with them. Okay, so I shall just move this on. Um, next question for you, how do you communicate with other people? How do you get your message across? So if you're confident and want to write something in the chat, that would be great. How do you communicate things to other people?
So if you don't want to type it in the chat, that's fine. You can just um, write a note to yourself here. So we're thinking about how you might communicate with others. So in this technological age, we use a lot of technology. So um, you might be writing to people, emails, WhatsApp messages, text messages. We might ring somebody and actually talk to them and use, um, use talking. Um, when we're physically with people, we might be using our body language or we might be, um, it might be about how we say things, not just what we're saying. So there are lots and lots of different ways that we communicate. And what I'm showing you now, are the different ways that we communicate in terms of young children. OK, so young children start to communicate to us using sounds and crying, gurgling, squealing, babbling, all of these sorts of things. And they also will then learn to use gestures and pointing. Um, but all of these things develop into a much more complicated system of communication. We start to use body language, posture, eye contact or eye movement. If we were to look at the door and somebody is in the room with us, within a moment or two, they will look at the door as well because they will notice where we're looking and it's almost like we've communicated to them someone's coming in or I've heard a noise at the door or whatever it might be. Um, so there's what we say in terms of our words. There's also how we say it. So the intonation, the way your voice goes up and down, or the volume that you're using, the pitch, the tone, all of these things. Some people use sign language if they know uh, signs. Um, we also obviously have the whole communication that's written using symbols, mark making, that side of things. But we also have our behaviour. And our behaviour is actually one of the main ways that children communicate with us as parents. So we're starting this session with the premise that all behaviour is communication. And I want to share with you the analogy of an iceberg. OK, so we all know that an iceberg, you only see a tiny tip above the surface of the sea. Underneath, there's always much more going on, isn't there? So in terms of behaviour, you could say that the same is true. So we need to be understanding those root causes of behaviour to address the underlying needs. So if behaviour, what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg, underneath what we see, there's a lot more going on. So for example, we might see sometimes aggressive behaviour or screaming or biting or throwing, fighting, all of those more negative things that challenge us as parents. Actually, what really is going on underneath for the child and the root causes of those behaviour might be a child trying to communicate with you. I'm tired. I'm hungry. You don't understand me. I'm, um, I need to have a cuddle. <laughs> um, I want that toy. You know, it's not fair. They're trying to communicate things to us by what we're not seeing, the bit that's under the surface. So we might see a child behaving in a way that displeases us, but underneath the surface, there's a lot more going on. And what I'm going to challenge you to do at some point in the future is draw yourself a little iceberg, okay? Choose a behaviour that is particularly challenging to you at the moment, something your child does or, or um, something that you're finding quite difficult to uh, find a solution to at the moment and I'd like you to write that at the tip of the iceberg and then through the course of this session and when you reflect on this afterwards I would like you to try and think what is the communication what is my child telling me here okay and so you try and work out what it is that's going on for your child once you know that you can address the behavior so all of these things under the waterline are things that we can help to resolve. They're problems that need to be solved.
okay so if if you think actually my child's just completely and utterly overtired then we need to plan a our, our next few days um, as slightly calmer, perhaps an earlier bedtime or a more relaxed, um, you know, time together or something. You, you would alter what you're doing in the light of the knowledge that your child is overtired and therefore see less of that poor behaviour that the tiredness was causing. OK, so that's your challenge. It's to write yourself, draw yourself a little iceberg think about the tip of the iceberg, what you're seeing that you want to change, and then try and work out the message, the communication, and then see that as a problem that needs to be solved. Okay, so what this is, is becoming a detective. You will be a behaviour detective. You're thinking about what your child is trying to tell you. What, what are they doing, um, you know, when they do what they do? Why are they doing it like that? Perhaps it's schematic. Now, if you were in my session last week, you'll know that schemas are repetitive play patterns that lots and lots of children do. Um, and it's almost like an urge to play in a particular way. Um, it's quite, quite normal for, for many children to uh, play in that way. But it can be very frustrating and annoying for the parents who are caring for them. Um, perhaps the behaviour could be attention seeking. In which case, the message that they're giving you is that I'm not getting enough attention at the moment. I need more attention. OK, maybe they're enjoying behaving in that way because there's some sort of reward in it for them. OK, um, maybe they like the way I'm responding as their parent. Maybe it's it's um, it's quite nice because um, because. What happens is, is um, you get cross with me, I cry, then you give me a really big cuddle. And actually, I quite like that really big cuddle. So it ends up OK, doesn't it? Can we miss out the middle man here and go uh, straight to that really big cuddle? So um, I can see, Zara, that you've popped a question there. Can you hold on to that question and pose it again at the end for me? Is that OK? And then, and then we'll cover that then. Thank you. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is think about the language we're using and how we're, um, we're uh, communicating with our children. That will hopefully help as well. So what we need to do is make sure we're using clear speech and simple phrases with our children. So um, uh, make sure that we're role modelling appropriate and accurate language to children. Think about the vocabulary that you're using. Make sure your message is being understood by, by your child. There are specific strategies you can use, like motherese, which is the name we give the high-pitched voice and the, um, the simple words and phrases. So if you can imagine a, a grandparent talking to um, a, a baby, they might say, oh, 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 look at you. And their voice is going up and down and up up and down and they're using funny you know funny expressions and um, they're making eye contact usually with the baby and we call that motheries and there's actually believe it or not been quite a lot of research that has that has shown that motheries is um is consistent in lots of different languages around the world so we're not just talking about english that i'm speaking but um it, we use that sort of tone and pitch and the up and down sing song voice with young children almost universally around the world. And the research has shown that it is exactly what babies need to hear because it helps them to tune into the different um, uh, the words that are being said, the way it's being said, the tone and everything. It's soothing to them and it helps them to learn language faster. So that's interesting, isn't it? Anyway, um, so recasting is another strategy we can use. This is when we might um, rephrase things for a child. So, so for example, you could turn it into a question or you could restate what they've said in a more kind of grammatically correct way. Um, or you could... Um, you could expand what they've done. So expanding is adding to what they've done. So the example could be if a child says car move road, car move road, then you could say, oh, yes, the car's driving along the road or something. So it sort of explains and it puts it in sort of more full sentences and, and things for the child. Um, Labelling things, children often will point and 
they're not always saying I want that sometimes they're saying oh what's that oh what's that <laughs> so we can name objects and and things for children um you know name people um repetitions very important as well because repetition is how our brains are hardwired to learn so um when they bring you the same book at bedtime again and again and again then we need to take a deep breath and read it again because actually it's exactly what our child needs in order to to hear that repetition of language will really help them to learn so we need to be um, maximising those opportunities to problem solve whenever they arise. So if there's a little um, a, a fight between two of your children, then you use that as an opportunity to teach them about learning to share and interact with other people. You problem solve with them, help them to control their emotions and to understand that it's OK to be cross with my brother but it's not okay to hit my brother when I'm cross with him. <laughs> so we're using it as an opportunity to problem solve and to teach our children um, uh, skills for the future. Um, we can use gestures and signs. That can be really helpful as well. And um, sign language is not just for people who are deaf. Sign language can really help very young children to understand language as well, in the same way that gestures become quite important at a certain phase of, of language learning. Um, value all attempts that your child makes at communicating with you. And obviously the most important thing is for us to remain calm and positive. So hopefully you'll pick up a few strategies today that will help with that. But what we need to think about are the messages that we're giving, okay? We don't always uh, say, what we mean or what the children get from what we say does not always um, say what we mean. So, for example, if a child's throwing the ball inside, we might respond, do we throw balls inside? Very sarcastic, not helpful at all to a young child. They won't understand that. And clearly we do throw balls inside because I've just thrown it. So um, what about if a child says no and, um, and they carry on playing and they're, they're being sort of very defiant to us? Um, well, actually, if our response is just do it now, you know, otherwise there'll be trouble. Well, actually, that's not very helpful because that's relying on us being big and powerful and then being small and powerless. Um, Amira, have you got a question for now or is it something that can um, wait for later? You're welcome to um, type into the chat if you'd like to. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just carry on, but do... do um, Keep a note of your question and we'll try and answer it a bit later. OK. Um, so if a child says, um, why can't I, whatever, do something? And we just respond, oh, because I said so. Well, again, there's no explanation there to the child. It's relying on the power, us being big and them being small. Um, if a child's crying and we kind of try and, and cheer them up by saying, oh, it's all right. We, we don't feel sad here. Come on, you're OK. Actually, that's not very helpful either. And just a simple one, if we're just, you know, literally patting a child on the head and saying, oh, good girl, good boy, that sort of thing, um, then that's not very helpful because that's empty praise. It's not explaining to the child exactly what it is that they've done. So, um, Amira, if you wanted to talk, you are welcome to unmute your microphone and ask a question if it's something that relates to, to this. OK, so I'll, I'll hopefully you'll pop a question in the Q&A box and I can answer it for you later. So these are not good responses. But what I'm going to do now, obviously, is give you some alternatives. OK, so if the child's thrown the ball inside and we know it's not OK, we, we can then say, oh, you want to play ball? Let's go to the park. We give them an alternative. We give them a way of doing what they want to do it on our terms so even if it's not now we can do it later but rather than just um you know being very dismissive to them 
then we can um, just try and allow the child to do it, but do it a bit later on, if you see what I mean. So what about if a child is repeatedly saying no to us and they're just ignoring us, carrying on playing? Um, then actually what we need to be doing, and, and this actually um, might help a little bit with your request, Sarah, as well. So if we give the child a warning before we need to stop, okay? And um, because actually children don't know our time scales. So often we'll be expecting them to know that it's, you know, if we're cooking and then we say, come on, stop, it's food time. And um, we expect them to know because surely they'll have seen us cooking. They know it's it's food time, but actually that, that doesn't enter their heads. So if we can give them a warning and say five more minutes, then you need to tidy or whatever. Um, if they're still not stopping, we can say, it's time to eat now. I know you want to keep playing we can get the game up tomorrow or it's time to eat now you can play after tea or whatever it might be um, we try and um, encourage the child to do what we want them uh, to do when we want them to do it and um, a natural consequence of them not coming on time is that their food will get cold and children will learn pretty quickly <laughs> that they don't really like their food getting cold so therefore they'll need to come on time if that makes sense it's called a natural consequence so if the child's saying why can't they do something like for example climbing on the chair we need to be giving some sort of explanation so you know we're worried that they'll fall and hurt themselves or whatever it might be if the child's crying or upset and we're kind of trying to just jolly them along we need to acknowledge that they're feeling that way and tell them it's okay to feel sad. You look really sad. We all feel sad sometimes and try and find out what happened. We don't leave them there. We would then try and um, find a solution together. Okay. Um, but just saying, saying to the child, Oh no, you're okay. You, you know, you'll be fine. Actually at that moment, that child doesn't feel okay and they don't feel fine. All right. So it's about acknowledging how they're feeling, not letting them stay there and wallow in their sadness for ages, but asking them to, you know, finding out what happened, acknowledging those feelings, and then you can move on. OK. Um, and the alternative to the empty praise, the good girl, good boy thing, is to actually tell them the bit they've done that that is good if you see what I mean so if you're saying good girl because they've painted this lovely picture and you think it's beautiful tell them that wow you've used loads of colors tell me about your picture or whatever so that's a really encouraging response just by you know saying good girl or good boy it doesn't give the child any feedback about what they've done that's good or bad and so therefore the child won't know what they need to repeat to be good in the future if that makes sense so by giving them that feedback okay so if they've come to the table when we've asked them to instead of just saying good boy because he's come to the table when i've asked him to i say wow i'm really proud of you because you've come to the table when i asked you to and then you need to positively reinforce that in some way so um you know, you could say um, high five or you could um, if you have some sort of reward system, you could do that. Or, you know, if you do do like um, Zara's saying iPad or screen time, you could say, well, you can have extra time because I'm really proud of what you've done or something. Um, I think I would say be be wary of using rewards too much because children can um, get reliant on them and it can be, it can become um, a negative thing. So um, if you can find a way of getting the child to, to want to do the thing that you're wanting them to do. So the motivation becomes intrinsic motivation from within them in, instead of um, the motivation in order to get whatever it might be, the reward might be. Um, it's a much more powerful motivation. So if we can try and find ways of, of motivating the child from within themselves, then that's a much, much better strategy to use. So um, this is about the messages that we're giving. And conflicts will either 
escalate or de-escalate with our children. So situations that arrive, incidences that arise will either get worse and escalate or calm down and de-escalate depending on how we handle them. So I've got some examples here on, on the screen. When we use you statements, okay, it's it becomes quite um, personal and um, quite blame heavy and so on the next slide I'm going to show you how we can use I statements instead. Um, when we use intense body language like like pointing or um, or um, standing up to our full height and being big and then being small or um, you know if we're using any sort of physical um, reprimands with children things will only get worse. OK, we need to, to um, use gentle body language. So no threatening behavior at all in terms of our positive uh, messages to our children. And I'm just going to very briefly now um, share with you some thoughts around smacking. Now, um, it's my view that it's never a good idea to use physical punishments and smacking as a way of, of disciplining children. In terms of positive parenting, that is not a strategy that would be used. Um, ideas about bringing up children have changed a lot in the last few years and we might feel under pressure sometimes by from older relatives or members of our family to give a child a smack. Um, and, you know, we might even think, oh, well, it never did me any harm. Um, however, we know a lot more now about the impact of harsh punishments and smacking on children's emotional health and well-being. There's been a lot of research that's looked into this. And also, if we're wanting our children to be kind to each other and we're wanting our children not to grow up to be violent or hit other people, we need to be acting as a role model. We need to also have kind hands all of the time. It shouldn't be one rule for us and another one for them. Um, it, it's very difficult to say, do what I say, not as I do. That is not a helpful way to parent at all. Um, it's very confusing for children and can also make them resentful and angry. And ultimately, I feel, damage our relationship with our children. So having a positive relationship with your child is um, something that will make parenting um, and discipline easier. So don't sabotage it by, um, you know, uh, smacking or, or being physical in how you're responding. So um, I've just been asked to give an example of motivating or, or encouraging children to motivate themselves. So um, yes, I'm talking about communication, but I'm also talking about um, finding things that our children will really like about what we're asking them to do. So, so if we're, if we're, um, if we're wanting to go out somewhere and do something and our child is dragging their heels and doesn't want to come with us, can we plan to go home via the park afterwards or something so that they will then want to come with us because they know on the way back they'll be doing X, Y, Z or something like that. So encouraging um, your child to participate in something because they want to do it. So I, I hope that sort of helps. Um, so the other um, points on this slide not not making accusations or blame and um this also focusing on the past can be really unhelpful so an example of this um let me think i won't give you an example with my child for this i'll give you an example with my husband <laughs> if i say to him um you never empty the bin or, or something like that actually that's really not a helpful thing. I'm saying, you know, it's always me. I always have to put the bin out or whatever. Um, actually, that's blaming and that's focusing on the past. But if I actually say, do you know, I'm ever so tired tonight and I've still got to put the bin out. My husband would then say, oh, I'll do it for you. And, and actually... Um, do it without me asking. Does that make sense? So one of them is very blamey and kind of finger pointy and the other one is very positive. So it, it's looking at 
one way or another of responding. So focusing on the person is not very helpful, but focusing on the problem helps. And that's because when we're focusing on the person or our position, it's back to that I'm big and you're small situation with the child, but focusing on the on the problem helps to focus on the child's needs and looking again at the iceberg and what's underpinning the behavior that we're seeing. And the last point on here, making assumptions. If we make assumptions, we'll look at that a little bit later on, um, things can get worse. But if we're listening carefully and being attuned to our children, that can help to calm things down. Okay. So the top one on the list about I statements, I'm going to share that with you now. So um, I statements are describing actions and situations or needs and things like that, rather than talking about people. OK, so what we normally do is say how we feel and then offer the child choices. So you can almost learn things like that as a little script. OK, so um, you might say, I feel worried because this is happening. You may either do this or this. OK, so a, a scenario there, if we see James swinging a stick near his brother, we want to stop him immediately to avoid an accident. How could we phrase that, do you think, in an I statement? Because we could say to James, James, stop it. Stop right now. OK, but if James doesn't particularly want to stop it, you telling him to stop might not stop him. OK, um, we need to give him reasons, we need to explain, and we need to be calm and positive about it. So changing it into an I statement can be really helpful. So, if we said, James, I feel really worried because that stick might hit your brother, you can either Use your stick over there, away from your brother, or you can put the stick down. OK, that's given James two options. It's explained how you feel. It's explained why you feel it and why what he's doing is potentially dangerous or wrong or, or whatever. And then it's given him something to do. So it's given him a way out. And what we need to do when we're offering those choices is make sure that one of those choices is definitely something James will want to do. So if I'd said, you can either put the stick down here or put the stick down there, James isn't going to really want to do that, is he? Because he wants to play with the stick right now. But playing with the stick isn't the bad thing. Playing with the stick might be OK. It's that I'm worried it's going to hurt somebody. That's the bad thing. So if we can avoid that, if we can move James or move the stick or perhaps put a rule in place. So you can either use the stick to draw on in the mud over here or you can um, move away from your brother and use the stick over there. OK, so we've got to think about the options that we're giving and try and make them attractive to our child so that they want to do them. And that links with what I was saying about the motivation. So, however, what is happening here is that it becomes on your terms. So it's about us offering James a way out. It's about us giving him, stopping the behavior that could be hurtful or might be wrong, um, but giving him a way to do it on our terms. Okay, so that's sort of what I'm talking about. So um, it's helpful to think about a child and their emotional well-being and development. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this because I'm going to ask you to tune in next week um, when I'm thinking about children's emotional um, development and um, behaviour. So um, I won't dwell on this particular one for now, but knowing the emotional needs of our children is really important. Reflecting on these sorts of questions um, can be really helpful because if we know what helps our child to calm down, we can um, organize those things to be available to them. If we know what makes them overexcited or anxious or frightened, we can try and avoid those things. Okay, so it's just about preempting the feelings that your child might have.
But there are lots of different times when, at home, children might behave in ways that we would prefer them not to. So you're welcome now either to jot down on paper or write in the chat some different reasons why children might behave the way they do. Okay, so lack of attention's one, absolutely. Um, I've got a little list here. I appreciate you're probably still thinking about this, but I've got my own little list here. So yeah, when they want something, not responding to their needs. So um, it could be simply over an object. You know, I had it first, it's mine. The whole sharing thing. Attention seeking, absolutely, is one as well. Um, you know space sometimes children want to sit in a particular seat and they're really cross if they aren't able to or, or something like that um sometimes it's about privileges and um maybe it's it's because they haven't had a turn on an ipad and they want to or something like that um it could be about friendships and about um you know things other people have said or done in a social context it could be related to time because we might be saying it's time to come to the table, which is going to cause problems if the child isn't expecting it or isn't ready to come to the table. Um, it could be um, because they're of communication issues or they're frustrated about something. Um, their needs aren't being met. They don't feel that they've been understood by us. It could be something simple, like they're really tired, overtired and over hungry, definitely sources of conflict with our young children. And another one I've popped there is um, the, the lack of theory of mind and empathy. Now, theory of mind is, is knowing that other people think, other people have thoughts and feelings that are different to my own. Um, and actually our young children struggle with this quite a lot because theory of mind is something that is developing up to about age six and some aspects of theory of mind are developing up to about age 11 so actually it's a very difficult thing for children to understand that other people might think differently and feel differently to me so um, the, an example of this might be if we know we've got an appointment and we need to leave the house in 10 minutes. Now, we've told our child, we've said, I've got an appointment. We need to leave the house in 10 minutes. OK, um, but your child isn't ready and it's making you late. You start getting stressed. Things start getting you start nagging, saying, come on, we're going. Come on, put your shoes on. Come on. We've got to go now. We should have gone five minutes ago. And it starts escalating. OK. They don't understand time. So young children, I'm talking about children under about the age of six here. They don't understand 10 minutes. It is actually a little bit meaningless to them. OK, um, they don't know how important your appointment is. They don't know that all morning you've been thinking about your appointment and you've known that you have to go out at this time. They don't know why you're crossed. In fact, you might have had the situation where um, you, you find your child suddenly says to you, Mummy, why are you shouting at me? And actually, <laughs> it's all built up and escalated. And you've seen this happening in the last 10 minutes. You've been saying, come on, we've got to go in a minute. Come on, put your shoes on. Come on now, hurry up, go to the loo, whatever it might be. And for you, it's been escalating. Your child hasn't picked up on that. And suddenly, we're late and everything explodes. And actually, this is because the child didn't have that understanding. They didn't know about the importance of the meeting. They wouldn't have got that. They didn't get the time elements. And so um, it was very easy for it to escalate. Now, a, a better way of playing that, it is down to us, I'm afraid, it's making sure that we're planning backwards and we're thinking about the time it's going to take to get out of the house and we plan ahead and we know that our child won't want to stop what they're doing, so we um, stop them early. 
and we give them a warning and we say in five minutes you've got to stop and then when five minutes come we say right we've said you've got to stop but we know that we've still got a bit of time before we need to go okay when you get to the door the chances are your child will want to put their shoes on themselves even though you know it's much quicker if you put them on your child okay um but they will want to do it themselves so again we plan a little bit of extra time in so that they can do it themselves because sometimes by saying no i'll do it for you and then we end up with a screaming child whereas if we just taken the extra two minutes and say okay you can do it and we take a deep breath and we you you know we're a bit more patient actually we'd get out of the house with a happy child which is worth a lot more i think um so when young children get upset, um, they're physically expressive. You can see it in their whole body. They might stamp their feet. They might go red in the face. They might cry and shout and scream. Often it's about independence and control. And our young children don't have many elements of their lives that they do control. We usually um, control everything sometimes even when they get up when they wake up we might have to wake them sometimes so we control what they eat we control when they eat we often control what they wear we always control where they go when they're young and usually what they do when they go there so it's no wonder that sometimes they want to do a few things for themselves <laughs> young children can't think about lots of things at once and um they won't understand the time elements. They'll often be thinking about their own needs and they won't realise that other people have needs as well. They won't have the language to tell you all of this. Um, and all of us, not just young children, but all of us find it hard to think and rationalise when we're getting angry or upset or stressed. Um, because we all go into that that um, freeze, fight or flight mode. That again, I will talk about next week if you tune in. <laughs> and what young children do do is, is focus on what they can see, hear, touch, feel around them. So the real hands on stuff around them. So um, what we find is that we have lots of issues that arise and it could be around some of these things. So bedtime routines or fussy eaters tantrums, hurtful behaviours, screaming, whining, inappropriate uh, language perhaps, or children who lie, children who find sharing difficult, they might be defiant or disrespectful, they might be destructive. And on your handout, you will find some strategies that will um, support you with each of those common parenting challenges. We haven't got time to answer them all right now, but I would recommend you to read that handout, keep it somewhere safe. You can refer back to it at any time. But one thing I will mention is this thing I said earlier about schemas. Um, and this is a repeated pattern of behaviour and thinking that's very common for young children. And it's often misinterpreted as poor behaviour. So, for example, a child who repeatedly throws their cup on the floor from the high chair or another child who always wants the yellow cup and the yellow plate and woe betide anyone who tries to give them a different colour. And these are very strong urges that children have. And it's easy for us as an adult to say, well, we mustn't let the child get their own way all of the time. But actually, it's not helpful to think of it in terms of us versus them. Then we're back to that negative um, power struggle we talked about at the beginning. As adults, we see the bigger picture. Um, children don't have bills to pay. They don't know about a global pandemic that's going on. They react and act in the moment. So if we can do something in that moment that will make them happy, we should, shouldn't we? So if giving them that yellow plate actually makes them happy, isn't that what we want to do? So you might be thinking, well, that's all very well. Um, but if we always let this child have what they're asking for, it's not fair on my other children or won't they just learn that, um, that they always get their way? Well, I do take your point. <laughs> but your other children might not care about the yellow plate. So actually, if it's the child that cares about the yellow plate that gets it, that will make them feel really loved. And I think it's about thinking about how your child will feel, looking at those emotions that are underpinning it. So 
Another point, I've nearly finished now, you'll be pleased to know. Another point I quickly want to raise is about sharing, okay? Because sharing is a, is a, is a time when we often get conflicts between children. So very quickly, how many different ways can you share a bag of sweets? So I wonder if share means the same thing to everybody. So if we had a bag of sweets, I could share them by colour. I could divide them up by colour or flavour. I could share them by number and say everybody's having one. I could decide that I like the red one, so I'm going to have all of those and I'll distribute the others out. We could say, let's have two now and put the rest away for later. I could decide I'm going to lick it and give it to you. You might not want it then. <laughs> Sharing means different things to different people. And actually, as adults, we don't have to share much at all. So um, sharing is something we have to teach our children. We need to explain what it means. If we're talking about taking it in turns, we need to say that. So sharing a slide at the play park is very different from sharing that bag of sweets I talked about. OK, so sharing is different in different circumstances. We have to explain it. So we need to role model that as well, because children don't see us as adults sharing. So we can play games with children that teach um, how to, to share. Use the language associated with sharing and taking turns. If we see our child sharing and taking turns, label that praise. So we're telling them the bit they're doing that's good. So we're not just saying, well done. We're saying, wow. That is amazing. You are sharing with your friend. You're taking it in turns or whatever it might be. And we'll need to sometimes plan specific things that will teach our children. And we can also um, try and resolve any issues that arise by thinking of it as a problem to be solved. And be realistic about your child. They won't always share. <laughs> so we need to just deal with that really and accept that they won't always share but that doesn't mean we don't try and teach them about sharing and teach them about being respectful to other people and as I said earlier we know the big picture but our children don't always know that so this child was allowed to draw on the windows paint on the windows and then the adult said it's time to draw the curtains meaning close the curtains and of course, the child drew on the curtains. It makes sense, really. But of course, that wasn't what was meant. And we could have seen this as misbehaviour, where in fact, it was a misunderstanding. The same was true with this little boy. He had already had a muffin and was told he wasn't allowed any more. But he was getting one for his brothers and he'd gone back to get them. And that's the sort of thing that we want to encourage. OK, so just finishing off with... We need to have clear expectations about our children's behaviour. Think about that iceberg and what's going on for the child. And that behaviour is communication. Be consistent in how you're responding to your child. Make sure that all of the adults working with your child or, or who look after your child are also consistent. So that means you'll have to talk to each other about how you're going to respond when your child behaves a certain way. Give lots of reassurance and love to build up children's self-esteem and make sure that your child knows you love them regardless of their behaviour. So you can use that positive praise. Try to catch them being good. Um, they will also imitate us. So make sure you're role modelling carefully and make sure that you're giving them something to imitate. <laughs> Um, remember that those schemes that happen are not misbehaviour. So um, if they're doing something repeatedly, it might not be misbehaviour. It could be a schema. Make sure you try and level that power dynamic. So get down to the child's level or even lower. Keep your voice calm and quiet. Teach your child about feelings and emotions and how they can calm down. And if we can, give a child a time warning before different transitions happen and allow plenty of time, um, then that will really help avoiding time and things like that. So if we're trying to put all of these things into place, we're wanting to encourage our children to be um, 
make friends and make good choices. And one of my key messages to you today is about being a role model to our children. And this is true about their social and moral development as well. So we want to actually be the children, we, sorry, be the adults that we want our children to grow into. Okay, so these are some ideas of how you can support your children to make good choices um, in their sort of friendships and things. But we've run out of time, so I need to hand the floor over to you and see if there are any um, questions. So what I will do, um, if, if I don't know the answer, I'll try and find out for you. Um, if you do want to raise your hand, you'll have to unmute your microphone, otherwise I won't hear you, okay? So I'm just gonna return to um, Zara's question. Okay, so Zara has asked, what if my child is persistent on something um, and they wanted something and we, um, we disagree to give it to the child, um, how should we react? Okay, so if your child's very persistent and demanding about something, we need to, again, think of it as that iceberg. So being persistent and demanding is the tip that we're seeing. We want to know uh, what's underneath that. So we need to think why. So is it just because they're enjoying playing on their iPad and they want more time? It could simply be that. In which case we need to think, are there any opportunities when they can do that? Is there a time when it would be appropriate? If, if now is no, then, um, then that's okay. It's, it's okay and appropriate to say no to our children sometimes, but it's always worth thinking, why am I saying no? Okay, because it's very easy as a parent um, to have no as our default answer. And we often need to take a step back and think, if I'm saying no, why am I saying no? Is there any time when the answer could be yes? Are there any circumstances in which the answer could be yes? Sometimes no has to be no and there has to be a full stop on it. OK, and we then need to explain to our child why. Usually in those situations, it's because of health or because of safety or because of, you know, that there will be a bottom line sometimes. Maybe it's because it's past their bedtime or something. But then we need to offer them an opportunity when they can do that. So if they're really, really being persistent and demanding, can we say, I want to say yes to you. I can't. We can't do it now. I'm going to write it down that in the morning, the first thing you can do after breakfast, after you've got dressed and cleaned your teeth or whatever your routine is, you can then have time on your iPad or whatever it might be. So if it has to be a no now, try and tell the child about a time when it will be a yes. OK, I hope that makes sense. Um, so, um, OK, there's a question in the question answer box. I'll just look at it in a minute. Um, so during potty training time, OK, um, potty, potty training is a very, very tricky time for us. And I, although I said be wary of rewards earlier on, I actually think potty training is something where rewards do work quite well. So you could decide that um, you're going to let your child have a reward when they do do a poo in the potty or in the toilet. Um, and... Um, but find something that they really want. So an example of that, um, uh, my, my child, when, um, when she was potty training, really, really wanted a little toy motorbike. What we did was we, we printed a picture of the toy motorbike and we cut it into six sections and it was um, made a jigsaw if that makes sense. And I showed her the picture of the motorbike and I said, when you have done a poo on the potty, you can have one of these pictures. When we build up the whole picture, we will go to the shop and buy the motorbike. In fact, I'd already bought the motorbike and because I was worried it wouldn't be available at a later date. So um, it was in my drawer upstairs. But um, I hope you sort of see how then the child, it's not that they get something straight away necessarily, but 
but they were able to see how I'm going to get the motorbike. And that's quite a nice way of doing a reward system because the child can see it building up and, and getting nearer to it because it's it's a physical one. Whereas sort of just saying five five stickers or five stamps on a chart doesn't necessarily mean quite so much to them. So, um, so I would suggest with potty training that rewards are helpful. Rewards are not quite so helpful um, at other times. So um, I'm just reading the questions in the question and answer. <clears throat> OK, so um, Doobie, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of um, controlling emotions, I would recommend that you do tune in next week because it is what the whole session is about um, but in terms of, of sort of throwing tantrums if it, this is your child who's 10 um, they need to understand that um, throwing the tantrum is not going to get them what they want so when they're calm not at that moment not in the tantrum but at another time the, a child of that age you can talk to them about it and you can put it into that I statement. You can say that um, I'm, I'm worried. Um, uh, let me just read what you've said again. So so don't get their way because they're throwing a tantrum. OK, so um, I'm worried about how upset you get um, when your sister gets whatever it is and you don't. OK, so um, how can I help you to feel calm or something like that and and or you could um try and talk to your child about um what helps them to feel calm explain to them that we don't all have the same things all the time um make sure your child knows that they, that you love them because often it will be um about privilege and they will see it as well you love that sibling more than you love me because they get such and such and I don't so try and work out imagine again that tip of the iceberg so imagine that underneath the waterline the child might be questioning Do, does my parent love my my sister more than me or something like that or my brother more than me so um, we need to then be focusing on answering that question knowing that that tantrum is the behavior that we're seeing because of the feeling that's underpinning it. So with a child of that age, again, we can talk about feelings in terms of a scale. You can find um, some pictures of a feeling scale. If you were to do a sort of Google image search, you can often get pictures. You might be able to get a frozen related one for you, um, showing Elsa when she's out of control, but also Elsa when she is in control and talking to your child about how you want her to be like Elsa when, um, when she's in control control not out of control if that makes sense so um yes do do try and um tune in next week if that's okay because um the the session is about um emotions so i'm hoping that that will will help you as well um i'm just reading these questions as well we're nearly done i know the time's uh, gone so um Okay, sleep is another difficult one. So um, bedtime routine is really important to try and be as consistent as you can with the bedtime routine. If you're worried about your child sitting behind the door, we need to think about why are they doing that? Is it because they're not tired? Um, in which case we might need to move bedtime a little bit later. Is it because they're, they, um, they like the attention that they get from you when they are sitting there and you're coming in and saying, oh, what are you doing? You're there again. You're meant to be in bed. And then you give them another cuddle. You know, maybe you can say, look, if you stay in your bed, I'm going to come and give you another cuddle. Um, go up again after a couple of minutes. Try and if you do that sort of thing, try and catch them being good. So don't leave it so long that the chances are they'll have got out of bed again. Go in really, really quickly and catch them when they're still in bed. And then you can praise them and big, big it up and say, oh, wow, that's amazing. You're still in bed. And then the next night you take a minute longer to go up and, and then the next night, two minutes longer and so on. So it's always a slow process with children, but it can help them um, 
it, to sort of understand the response that you got. So, um, and in terms, I'm just going to do one last question, if that's okay with everyone. In terms of, of the, the drama queen or the child who is, is really trying to get your attention all the time, um, again, think of that iceberg. OK, if they're if they're really being over the top with their emotions, the chances are there's something going on underneath the waterline. And what we need to do is be that detective and try and work out what it is. It could be that your child is saying that I need more attention, in which case we need to give them attention at an appropriate time. So not when they're being over the top and dramatic and being that drama queen, but at another time and tell them that's why you're giving them the attention now, if that makes sense. So, so that they begin to understand that they're getting that positive attention from you at a time when they're doing the, the, the good things that you want them to do more of and try not to give them that attention at the time when they're being over the top does that make sense but there is something about um about uh hope well hopefully on your handout you'll find some answers to some of these questions and thank you ever so much for tuning in i'm sorry that we've gone over by a few minutes and um, please do tune in uh, next week and i look forward to hearing from you all thank you